Well, I wonder how confident you would feel if somebody came to you at work and asked to explain the basic message of the gospel. Or if you left St. Thomas's for another church, I wonder how equipped you would feel to go there and be an active and helpful and useful member of their church. We have plenty of needs here at St. Thomas's, scripture, discipleship group leading, youth, kids. I wonder how confident and ready you feel to serve. Well, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at a number of individuals who illustrate the priorities of the local church. And this week, we're looking at being equipped. Our series began a few weeks ago in December. Mike showed us how the risen and ascended Lord Jesus sits at God's right hand and how he enables his church to go forward and grow. Jared showed us how Philip engaged an earnest seeker and answered his questions about Jesus. Then Richard took us through Peter's evangelistic sermon where 3,000 people responded and were added to the church. Then last week, Simon explained how Barnabas would come alongside and help people get established in the church. And, and as I said, this week we're going to look at how Paul equips that those who are in the church for acts of good work, acts of good works. If you've been around St. Thomas's for some time, hopefully these E's might sound familiar. I tried to sort of weave them in in my little summary. As people come into our spheres of influence, we want to engage their hearts with the gospel. Then we want to evangelize them and lay before them clearly what it means to repent and believe. And once they respond, we want to establish them in the church and equip them for good works. And we've called this series No Easy Answer because there are no shortcuts when it comes to making mature, radical disciples of the Lord Jesus. We're completely dependent on Him. We're completely dependent on God to enable the whole process. So what better way to begin than by asking for God's help? Would you join me in prayer now? Now, Father, we come before you asking that you would incline our hearts to your word. Father, would you open our eyes to see wondrous things in it? Would you unite our hearts to fear your name? And would you satisfy us with your steadfast love this morning? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just a few days ago, on the last night of summer camp, it's a great summer camp, by the way, on the last night, we said goodbye to the outgoing Year 12s and their leaders. It was a very encouraging, very emotional um, final evening. And it was really, really encouraging to see the outgoing Year 12s, the ones who have come through the pressures of six years of schooling, six years of um, pressure to conform to the world, to conform to the, um, the desires of, of this world, to conform to their peers' expectations. They've come through the pressures of last year through the HSC, and they've made it through all of this. And their advice to the younger years, their the, other, the rest of those in the lights community was to stick with Jesus. He is worth it. He will carry you. He will sustain you. It was an emotional night, but it was very, very encouraging. Well, the, the situation that we have before us is similar. It's a, a farewell where Paul is exhorting and encouraging and commissioning those who will take over the responsibility for the Ephesian church in his absence. And in his farewell speech, we have a insight into Paul's priorities, what Paul thinks is most important for the church to go forward. Firstly, he looks back. He wants to remind them of his example. 
And secondly, he looks forward and he prepares them for works of service. So these are my two points. Paul reminds them of his example and he prepares them for their work in his absence. So firstly, Paul reminds them of his example. In verses 18 to 27, Paul reminds the elders of the example that he set for them at Ephesus. If you look back in your Bibles at chapter 19, you'll see that Paul was only in Ephesus for a very short time, just over two years, two and a bit years. But they were an extraordinary two years. And in his time there, Paul was committed to two things. He, firstly, he was committed to humble service in great opposition. Humble service. In verses 18 and 19, we see that humility and tears were the marks of his ministry. In chapter 19, when Paul arrived in Ephesus, he found that there were disciples who had no idea about Jesus. They'd had teachers who hadn't taught them about the Lord Jesus. They had no idea who the Holy Spirit was. They'd only received the baptism of John. Instead of coming in heavy-handed, criticising their teachers and scolding them as heretics and driving them out, he comes alongside them gently and he explains where, what it means to live under the Lord Jesus, what it means to follow John's baptism through to its logical conclusion. John pointed to Jesus and so he explains to them about Jesus and he prays for them and, receives, and they receive the Holy Spirit. Well, after that, in verse 7, he entered the synagogue and for three months he would reason with them and daily he would persuade them that Jesus was the Christ. Amidst impersonations and great opposition, Paul set about proclaiming to them that Jesus is Lord, that there is a new Lord in town, that Caesar is not Lord, he is the Lord of this earth, but that Jesus is the Lord, the risen and ascended Jesus who rules and reigns from heaven. And I have no doubt that as he was wrestling with, these, with his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters, that he would have done so with tears of love. Later in Romans 9, Paul writes that, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish. I wish that I myself would be cursed and cut off for the sake of my people. These are his brothers whom he loves deeply and yet they are rejecting the Lord Jesus. These are the kinds of tears that a parent prays for their lost child. I remember one brother, a colleague in ministry, he lamented to me that his prayers had so little tears in them. It was very convicting. But this was Paul's ministry, full of love, full of conviction, full of humility. And while there was much opposition in Ephesus, both, both from outside, both from the Greeks and from inside, from the Jews who opposed him, we can see that he was committed to serving them. He was committed to humble service amidst great opposition. And the tears of love flowed in those two years. Secondly, we see that Paul was committed to evangelism. In verses 20 to 21, Paul was committed to proclaiming Jesus, both broadly and deeply. There wasn't anything that he, that he held back from them. Whatever would be helpful, he would discuss with them. He would teach them and equip them so that they had everything that they needed for repentance and faith. It was a deep teaching and it was a broad effort. He went publicly and privately. He went from house to house and from synagogue to synagogue. He went to both Jews and to Greeks, we read in these verses. In fact, so extraordinary was this evangelistic effort that Demetrius, the silversmith, claimed that all over Asia, people were turning away from worshipping Artemis, the god of the Ephesians. All over Asia, 
people were leaving their idols and turning to Christ. It would have been a wonderful time, I'm sure, to be a Christian in that time. I think the most systematic approach we have to reaching out to our whole parish, to the whole Lower North Shore, is at Easter and Christmas when we do our letterbox drops. But these are just silent pieces of paper, aren't they? Easily discarded or neglected and looked over. What a wonderful year it would be if the whole of the Lower North Shore were engaged with the gospel. Isn't that what we want to see? Isn't that what we're on about? Well, Paul equipped the church by firstly reminding them of his example and his priority of evangelism. This is how Paul encouraged them to look back, his humble service and the importance of evangelism. Secondly, in verses 22 and following, Paul looks forward and he prepares them for the future without him. In verses 22, 25, and 32, you'll notice in your NIVs, the little word now keeps appearing. And I think this very um, helpfully indicates a shift in Paul's farewell speech. If you've got an ESV, which I was preparing off, they've actually um, rearranged the paragraphs. So if you can see an NIV, the NIV very helpfully lays out the breakdown. Well, firstly, in verses 22 to 24, we see that Paul prepares them for his absence. In these verses, he very lovingly reveals his plans. His plans are that he won't be sticking around, that he will be moving on. His, but note that his plans are not for greatness, but rather for obedience. He's compelled by the Spirit to go back to Jerusalem and even though his future is uncertain, he's more concerned about being faithful and finishing his course than he is settling down. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Well, perhaps the Ephesian elders were wondering, the, the question in the air is, what would happen to their church? What would their church look like after the great apostle was off, to, was off the scene? Would it all go to the dogs? Would people just gradually dis, disappear and go back to their homes as if nothing ever happened? Or would the church of God continue to meet? Would they continue to gather around his word? Perhaps some of you are wondering what will happen to St. Thomas's after the Manchesters are leaving. As one faithful minister's wife keeps reminding me, Luke, it's not our work, it's the Lord's. And he will continue his good work. The Lord has sustained us for many years. He's blessed us for many years. And he will be faithful for many more to come. It amazes me how for 2,000 years the flicker of the gospel the light of the gospel has continued to burn. One of my favourite lines is from the hymn, Facing a Task Unfinished. We bear the torch that flaming fell from the hands of those who gave their lives proclaiming that Jesus died and rose. Ours is the same commission, the same commission, the same glad message ours, fired by the same ambition, to thee we yield our powers. So Paul lovingly prepares them for his absence and he gets them ready for a new season. He doesn't want them to be over-reliant on him, but having invested in them, having proclaimed the word of God to them daily, they are now ready, ready to lead the church, ready to serve, ready to continue being Jesus' witnesses in Ephesus. Well, the second way that he prepares them is by preparing them for their responsibilities. In verses 25 to 31, we see the great pastoral weight, the great burden that Paul had for them. He had labored night and day to establish them in the faith. 
He was responsible for their destiny. And this is the great burden that many will feel as they handle the Word of God. If you're in a teaching responsibility, whether it's teaching the little ones or taking an SRE class or whether you're running a Bible study in the boardroom, we are responsible for handling the Word of God, for handling it with great care because people's lives are at stake. For three years, Paul declared to them the whole will of God. He reasoned with them daily. I'm sure no topics were off limit for Paul. From the person and work of Christ to the second coming, from the origins of evil to the wrath of God. Paul's aim was to declare to them the whole will of God. And so having prepared them by, by teaching them the word of God, he gets them ready for their responsibilities as shepherds of the, of the flock. And note that this is no ordinary flock. This is the flock that Jesus bought with his own blood. That Jesus, the great shepherd, paid for with his own blood. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, you might be tempted to think that this is just a religious gathering where people come and listen to someone speak for a couple of minutes and then they go away feeling good about themselves, having done what God demands. Can I tell you that nothing is more further from the truth? Those who are here are valued and precious. The Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, has died for them. And it's our prayer that you too would come to know the great love that he, he has had for you as well. Where do you get a shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep? Well, these shepherds are to be on high alert. They're to pay careful attention. They're to pay careful attention firstly to themselves. As Stott writes, for they cannot care adequately for others unless they first care for the culture of their own souls. And secondly, having cared for themselves, they're to care for the flock. Why? Because wolves are coming. Deceptive teachers who twist the truth are coming. Now, what's scary about these deceptive teachers is not only will they come with the intent to destroy, to twist the truth and lead others away, but they will also rise up from even among them. So these elders are to be constantly watching, watching and warning, watching the flock and warning them with the truth. Now this raises an important question for us. How can you know if someone is a wolf or a shepherd? How do you know the difference between a good teacher and someone who is fundamentally destructive and unhelpful, even if they're a little bit ignorant and misinformed? I think the answer to this question is that you can tell the wolf from the shepherd to the degree that they are willing to teach the whole truth, the whole counsel of God, even the unpleasant topics. Matt Chandler, a minister in America, he, he writes, the avoidance of difficult things in scripture, of sin, of hell, of the severity of God is idolatrous and cowardly. If a man or woman who teaches the scriptures is afraid to tell you about the severity of God, they have betrayed you. And sadly, they love their ego more than themselves, more than you. And so Paul prepares them for the responsibility that they will have. He has now, he is moving on and they are to watch over the flock and they are to warn them. They are to teach them the whole counsel of God. And if you're here today and if you're uh, part of this flock, what better thing to do than to take aside one of your ministers and say, you know what? I'm going to round up my discipleship group. I'm going to round up a new group of believers and I want you to come and teach us. I want you to equip us for the days ahead. 
Well, thirdly, the third thing that Paul prepares them for is from so- for something that will rise up within, and that is temptation. As the flock will be prone to teachers coming from without, coming from outside the gathering, so the leaders will also be prone to temptation around their hearts. In verses 32 to 35, Paul warns them about the dangers of pursuing wealth. Now, you might think that the temptation to wealth sounds a bit misplaced, but I think this is one of the great temptations that Christian leaders face. They have given up much for the sake of the gospel, and it's very easy for resentment to fill their hearts. If I've given up all this, then why shouldn't others give back to me? It's very quickly, very easy for leaders to become covetous, to see what their congregation enjoy, and to long to use their positions of influence for such gain. When we were going through our professional standards training as ministers, we were horrified to hear how, me- how often uh, large sums were bequeathed to the church, not just to the church, but to the minister. These ministers who had cared for people in their last few years and months and weeks had suddenly appeared in these wills of these wealthy parishioners. Now, whether it's the desire to just have a house in Sydney or whether it's the desire to get your kid through private schooling, covetousness amongst leaders, all leaders, is something that we need to keep in check. Well, what are we to do? Paul says we are to work hard like he did, to provide for our own needs and to remember the words of Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So the third way that he prepares them is by warning them against the temptations to greed and covetousness. So how did Paul equip the saints for ministry? Firstly, he told them to look back to his example, his example of humble service in constant trials and fervent evangelism in huge oppositions. Well, may 2019 be a year of humble service for us. As we push through the discouragements, the frustrations, as we push through the disappointments of feeling let down and abandoned, may it be a year of humble service for us. And may it be a year of fervent evangelism Under God, we're trusting and praying and planning for two invitation weeks. And it's our plan, our desire, our dream that the whole of the Lower North Shore would know that they can come here and hear about the Lord Jesus. Well, having reminded them to look back, Paul also equips them for their works in his absence. And he warns them, of the spiritual dangers of spiritual wolves and worldly wealth. Spiritual wolves attacking the flock and greed and covetousness wrapping itself around the hearts of its leaders. Let's pray as we close. Our Father, we thank you so much for this reminder that we are to serve humbly and even with tears, as Paul did. Father, thanks for Paul's reminder to evangelize fervently. Father, would you make us bold for the sake of your son this year? And Father, we thank you for those who have sat with us and who have taught us and equipped us to handle your word carefully. Thank you for those who have held back nothing, but have laid out the whole truth and answered our questions for us. And Father, as we go forward in 2019, Father, please guard us from the wolves, the spiritual wolves, with their deceptive teaching, who seek to destroy. And Father, would you protect our hearts from the temptation to worldly wealth, so that we may remember Christ's words, and help the weak. We pray all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.